And we are live here on Plus Runs. Uh, ba 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 Woo! Get off I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna Strong put, start. Put Strong the title. Start. Put the title slide back up. I'm not. I'm not unmuting yeah. us. Everybody can hear everything I'm saying. We're gonna pretend that didn't happen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. We'll just walk back. Try it again. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And we're live here on Plus One EXP's Roll for Content channel. My name is Tony Vicenda. I am Chief Alchemist here at Plus One EXP, which is a weird little brand that multi-classes in tabletop game design, beard and skincare alchemy in the Bardic College of Content Creation. Our hope and desire is to help amazing designers find great players who love their games and amazing players find great designers whose games they can love. I do love the flubbed start back to the title graphic bit keegan uh has noted in the chat uh, that is absolutely true but i also love sitting down uh with friends of mine co-workers people in the field that i love and talking to them about how we can do uh what we do better our dream like i said is to help people discover indie and small press games a a significant part of that uh for good or for ill is crowdfunding in the space during the course of february a number of events that all fall underneath the banner of zine month uh, happen that could be things like Zine Quest over on Kickstarter, Nonstop Tabletop over on Crowdfunder, uh, or funding or releasing projects on people's own site or crowdfunding sites um, all across the internet. Uh, people who are looking to the community to say, hey, I've got a small zine sized RPG that I want to release, something, you know, that. Uh, has a couple staples in the spine uh, and some absolutely amazing uh, content inside and maybe a uh, an otter penis on the front or maybe not, depending oh, on which version you ordered uh, of this one. Um, and they want to know one big question. Um, they have a lot of questions. That's why we're doing this whole series of workshops. But the one we're going to talk about today specifically is how do I build a crowdfunding budget without getting audited? What um, what things do I need to take into account? What should my number be? Um, so even though we're looking at Zine Month, uh, I brought in people who have done everything uh, from uh, very small Zine projects in direct release all the way up through uh, hundreds of thousands or even million dollar Kickstarters, uh, people who I thought could just speak incredibly well to the planning process and thought process that goes into this um, from two very different parts of the RPG uh, space. So we've got uh, my my two good friends, uh, Jarrett Crater and Jay Dragon with us. Today. Let's start with Jay. Um, Jay, why don't you go ahead and tell people uh, who you are, what you do, and and, and not to brag. Um, that's not, you know, not, not that you would have, because it's good, but it is, I think, also hard for us sometimes to talk about. Tell us about some of the projects you've crowdfunded and what kind of makes you an expert in this area. 
Yeah, so hi, my name is Jay Dragon. I'm the lesbian that lives in Tony's attic. Uh, I uh, don't often use pronouns, but I do on occasion. Um, uh, I uh, am the uh, editorial director at Possum Creek Games, uh, and I'm a game designer, writer, uh, and little weirdo. Um, I uh, am pretty well known for some Smash successes. I think the ones that people like to talk about is when I made 300,000 on Kickstarter with Wander Home, and then two years later did it again on Indiegogo with Yuseta's Bed and Breakfast. Um, Tony is wrong, I love to brag, I'm an arrogant little bastard, but um, with all that said, uh, I have had experience with everything from getting zines, like making zines at, zines at Staples and then like shipping them out on media mail to uh, fulfilling international enormous, you know, 10,000 plus orders. Um, so I've, I've got a lot of work in the modern tabletop scene at a wide variety of scales in a number of different contexts and have caught lightning in a bottom multiple times. So nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to have you here with us, Jay, as always. And then we've got uh, Jarrett Crater, uh, who is head penguin uh, at Space Quit Penguin that. Inc. Uh, do what? Quit that. It's 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 literally underneath your face right now. That's literally. Oh, did what you it do says. that? I don't know. Did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The last time too. That's what name, I. That's I asked you what you wanted to be called. Time? You didn't tell me, and so you got head penguin. Um, I could have been Maitre D at Space Penguin Inc. That could have that could have worked out also too. Uh, you, need, you need a real title. You got to. <laughs> Jared, uh, why don't Why don't you tell people who you are, uh, what you do, where they can find you online? Sure. Uh, I'm Jarrett, and uh, I help make a bunch of games. Uh, this is my 11th year in um, our little scenes, um, doing all kinds of fun stuff, primarily uh, editorial um, design, project management, um, much like Jay. I, I've been little zines here and there, um, all the way up to, you know, being behind the scenes on multi-million dollar Kickstarters and stuff like that. So um, just a lot of knowledge in this head. And sometimes Tony asked me to shake it up. So uh, go ahead and say some of the projects you've been connected to, even though you would not necessarily been project lead on some of these, these are bigger games. They do again, pushing people. I want people to get a little bit of a sense of some of the projects that you've helped contribute to. Sure. Um, Mothership, Troika, more, Borg, UVG, OSC, Through the Void. Ooh, gotcha, Tony. Gotcha. Um, you're, you're basically the ooh, back end of the OS. You got, you got <laughs> me. <laughs> Modern yeah. OS bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, yep. Yeah, um, it's it's if, after this year, it'll be over 600 published credits total, I think. So I kind of need to catch up for last year, <laughs> from last year. So I have a, I have a ludography and I, Sometimes I remember to, to update it, so. Awesome. Uh, I am very excited to have everybody here, and we've got plenty of people who are watching right now. Uh, we always start these out after we kind of – oh, by the way, I've done crowdfunding before also, too. My largest project is like $20,000, um, but I have done a number of them. I also spend a lot of time helping people build out crowdfunding pages, many of which are even more successful than the ones I built for myself. Uh, maybe I should just start focusing on my own stuff more. Um, but um, I am somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about the sales funnel and marketing aspect, which uh, if you ask me, crowdfunding, the largest function of it in, in the modern gaming space, whether we like it or not, is really a, as a marketing tool. Um, and that's not to say that it doesn't help projects exist that would not exist otherwise, specifically a lot of the projects that we just uh, mentioned. But um, there is a huge reality that helps can help get the word out about your game, but it does have some drawbacks also, specifically on the budgetary consideration sides that you need to think about and what you need to look at. So we are going to be diving into a whole lot of different things. Um, there's there's a very complex thing. Uh, one of the things that you will notice that none of us said, though, none of us are accountants. Uh, none of us are here to give you legal advice or specific explicit financial advice on how you should manage your individual taxes. We're here to give you general advice on how you can build a sick budget to help your crowdfunding project be successful, um, no matter how small or large it is. Um, that is specifically what we're talking about. Uh, and we'll cover some of that. But again, none of us are professionals. And I want to just clearly state that right off the top. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so again, I think for us, one of the things that we start with every single time, and if you out are out there watching right now, please go ahead and type in the chat, whether it's now or later on, uh, live or after the fact. Um, what are the questions that you have about this topic? Um, go ahead, If you can, put a cue in front of it because it'll help us identify them uh, later as I'm scrolling back through. But either way, just go ahead and drop them in the chat wherever you're at if you have specific questions. But I like us to just kind of reflect on what are some of the questions as somebody's looking at a budget for the first time, Jarrett, Jay, what are some of the questions that we need to be asking ourselves? Uh, maybe we can go back and forth between the two of you um, and our secret list that helps us feel uh, totally organized about what are some of the questions that we should be asking ourselves as we're, as we're looking at starting to build our budget. Jay, let's start with you. Yeah. So I think that the number one thing that you should be thinking about is um, this is kind of like the the thing I come to, I guess. Sorry, Tony. I'm sorry for, for immediately vamping on this. Um, right, do it. But uh, I think that the, the thing that I always am coming back to kind of like when I am checking to see if a budget is feasible, I'm looking at how much I think on average I can sell like like the value of the of the average backer, how much money they're giving, and uh, how many people I think I can get based on equivalently sized projects to me, like what my peers are up to, what like is going on around me, and those two numbers multiplied together is kind of your 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 golden thing to return to at all times. Is you're always asking yourself, how much am I making off of like how much is each person spending how many people can i get does that does that come together in a way that makes my, the number i'm working with reasonable right like if i estimate i need $5000 and i need to get 2000 people to back that might not be feasible right. in order to make $5000 which like oh god sell your stuff for more um but if i only need i don't know 20 people to back that then okay this budget is really reasonable i can probably get 20 people to back my project and get that. So like that is kind of always always be returning to that be like, "Oh, can I like do I think I can get each person to spend $60? Can I get each of them to spend $55? And then how many people do I think I can get? Does that look right? Does that look right? You know, like do I think I can get like it, oh, if for all of my stretch goals I would need to get only 500 people to back. Okay, then these stretch goals feel pretty reasonable. Oh, in order to get even my first stretch goal, I need 10,000 people to back. I don't know if that's going to be reasonable or possible, right? So having that little loop in your head is kind of, I think, the number one thing you should be thinking about at all times is just how much is these backers spending? How many backers do you think you can get? How does that look compared to your budget? Yeah, 100% that whenever somebody comes to me with a budget and says, how do I, what is this? Do mm -hmm. I think this is going to say, how much is your core pledge? Like, what is the, yeah. Yeah. the mm -hmm. initial physical pledge level cost that you think most people are going to go in on? Um, Cool. Divide this number by that number. Can you get that many backers? That's mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's what you got to ask yourself. And if not, you've got to mess with one of those two numbers mm -hmm. to figure out what you're going to do. 100%. I think that's just golden advice uh, mm -hmm. right off the top. Yeah. Um, Jared, how about you? What's another question we should be asking ourselves besides those two numbers as we dive into this? Uh, overall, do you have the heart for it? <laughs> There's that. Um um yeah really do do you have the confidence and in and the and the wherewithal like are you good with money are do you trust yourself enough with this to make sure that whatever you're going to do whatever wherever you set those numbers that you stick to it that you don't suddenly decide to shoot for the moon with a bunch of stretch goals that you're not going to hit um over you know making oofs and over promises um just you know taking stock of your own abilities and stuff like that um and being okay with hiring a professional or asking for exterior help if you don't think you can do this 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 shows you it's kind of a loose overview and like tony said none of the three of us are experts we do have quite a bit of experience so um you know reach out there's also um michael mars i know does a ton of consulting um they're also you know fantastic person to reach out to um for folks just really in the know um yeah just uh do you have the do you have the wherewithal to withstand this um can you focus it and if you can't are you okay with asking for help i think a, a really good thing to keep in mind is that 
your strengths and weaknesses don't change when you go from your personal life to your hobby, creative, indie life. If you are really good at balancing your own personal budget, that is a skill that's going to extend into your creative work. Uh, I know my weaknesses when it comes to money. I know that I have a tendency to overspend and overpromise, um, and that I tend to not be great at keeping track of funds. That's just some weaknesses I have in my personal life. And the number one thing I had to do when I got into crowdfunding was create rigorous tools to keep me from indulging in those weaknesses I have, or to kind of structure crowdfunding being like, I know I'm paying this artist like, maybe more than someone else might because it's important to me to overpay. Um, and that's just going to be like a built in, you know, like weakness. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a positive I, part to trade, but it's I a put my money in a bank account that I have to physically go to that's across yeah. the city so that I do not have an easy way to just transfer funds around. Yes. From crowdfunding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a thing I do for mm -hmm. the exact same reason. Cause it's easy to think I'm going to invest it in here. We're going to get it here. We'll have it back in. And you get mm -hmm. into such weird spaces when that happens. So you yeah, got, got to know, know thyself. Um, uh, but then let's, let's get some of the kind of deep into the practicals of some of this. Let's talk about the actual kind of pieces that maybe get us to one of those numbers of, Hey, what is the cost of this good? You know? So uh, I know mm -hmm. that I think maybe Jared said, you know, one of the things we want to look at um, is like, what are we actually making? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Like Jared and I Jared, know that Jared, when you and I have talks, or even Jay, when you and I have, Lots of times if somebody's asking us what should something cost, like for Jarrett and I especially, like number one thing we're going to do, we're going to open Mixam, we're going to put in 200 copies, we're going to put in all the specifications of the thing, we're going to figure mm. out what the actual cost to produce is based on format, page count, any extras we want, maps, dices, box. Um, uh, it is it is like right now I'm working with a board game manufacturer. I know Jay's looking at some of the same things. I know Jarrett's looking at some of the same things. Uh, which means, you know, going above and beyond Mixum, but because they will do a lot of the work for you on if you get this many units, it costs this much. Here's how much it is. But they want to know the exact same thing. What are all the things you want to do? Um, but I think one of the most important things that Jared kind of suggested for this piece when we were in our in our pre-talk was like keeping it simple, right? Um, that was actually, that was me. I was like, you tell us, Jay, tell us wrote, keep it simple, stupid in bold. There you go. The Jay, middle. tell us about keep it, keep it simple, stupid. Why is it important to keep it simple? Um, so here's the thing. You go on a crowdfunding platform of your choice and you look at these large, you know, 300, $500 million crowdfunding projects and you go to yourself, oh, in order to succeed, I need to look like Avatar Legends. I need to look like Wanderham. I need to look like Mothership. You're wrong. You don't want to look like those things. Those things, it's not... These, these large projects didn't make the money they did because they are structured the way they are. They are structured the way they are because the creators anticipated they could make a certain amount of money and put in that threshold of work. You sh For your first project, unless you have the backing of a venture capital firm or are like, I don't know, an RPG Nepo baby, you should not think you can make more than $20,000. Like that, that's the highest number I can imagine you making. Um, and that is true for me and true for everyone. Um, and with that, you want to keep your work simple. So every single thing you add to the project, even if it's a friend pitching in to help out, is another logistical complexity. Every single person involved is another layer that makes it harder. Every single paycheck you have to write, even if it's for like 10 bucks, is another thing you have to keep track of. You want to keep it as simple as possible. Truly reduce it down to the basics and build up from there. You don't want to be, like, if your first project doesn't have stretch goals, good. Uh, if you commission one piece of art and it's the cover art, good. Uh, if you, uh, you know, like trade swap with a friend to do editing, good. Like every single thing you can do to reduce the complexity and like logistical load of the project, the better. You're not trying to make Avatar Legends. You are, you are like, you are trying to make like especially for your first project, you are trying to make the simplest thing you can. And every, like, even things that you might not think are complications, like international shipping, or, a, a, I don't know, um, like multiple artists, or getting your friend to help create it with you. 
those are all complications that you have to think of like a complexity budget as well. Like, do you have the emotional load in addition to how you spend your time and the rest of your life, you know, balancing, you know, your, your love for the creative process with the rest of your world? How do you balance it all together? Do you have the complexity budget for international shipping, right? Those and, sorts of things. And none of those projects started out as that company's first project that you mentioned, right? Like yeah. people had done other things before they did those things to get them to that yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and so like you might, you might Jack Harrison mousehole press, like run away and get 50 K on your zine, right? Like you might yeah. do that first time out, but it's very unlikely that you will. And if it happens, it's probably due to you putting together a really excellent project and then people falling in love with that project. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about how you build a page that helps share your project well um, at our next um, Zemo workshop. But um, it is one of the huge things that can contribute to that. Um, let's talk a little bit about MSRP. Like, what am I going to, what is that number, that first number that, hey, what do we think people are going to give for this? Um, you know, I know that I've talked to, but we've, we've all three of us had extensive conversations about this. Jared, when you're looking at what something's going to retail for, because not only through crowdfunding, you over the last couple of years have helped release hundreds of projects that have gone into uh, to retail um, for especially for TTRPGs. What are some of the things that you take into account when thinking what is the price point of the zine or the project I want to sell? Uh, market research. Yay. Uh, going to your friendly or unfriendly local game store, comic book shop, Barnes and Noble, wherever, L website, anything. Looking at everyone else's MSRP, comparing it uh, form factor. Is it a five? Is it a four? Is it hardcover? Is it softcover? What's the binding? All of the technical specs of the book itself. Uh, and and finding a comparative spot and then just being like, okay, cool. So, you know, this book, this this D D five book is 40 bucks, but then someone can get it for 22 on Amazon, you know, pennies or whatever it is. Yeah, but they're also, you know, economy of scale there. Mm -hmm. And then finding out, you know, how close your project is in size and shape to that. That's that's one part of it. And then you'll want to run quotes. You'll run to, you know, hit up all kinds of suppliers. So for books, you know, whether it's, you know, a zine printing place that works really well, like your local mom and pop shop, something like that. Um, Mig Sam, um, any sort of like large hardcover place, um, Friesen, Standartu, uh, anywhere in Southeast Asia, you want to run quotes, you want to get three or four prices and you want to, you, you don't always want to take the lowest one. You want to know quality. Sometimes that involves samples as well. Um, so you take all those things and you put them all in a blender and then, and you, and you point to, again, what you think your average, it goes back to what Jay said at the beginning, what you think your average backer at your sweet spot is going to buy in at. And if they're going to look at 126 page, a four book for 40 bucks and not blink, then that's your, that's your, that's your MSRP. That's what you want to hit. Um, you have to factor in, you're going to be running sales two or three times a year, you, you know, holidays, whatnot, your, your company anniversary, say you go to a show, you know, you do a convention and you want to take a bunch of stuff to get, um, you know, to get rid of, to, to move unit, you know, to liquidate inventory, that sort of stuff. So you have to, you have to factor in all of those things. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest would be market research. Look at what everybody else is doing kind of around you and then kind of gauge. And then again, I said it earlier, when in doubt, ask. There's nothing wrong with asking a random Discord server or mass that on instance. I don't know what this means. What should I do? You're going to get a, a, a bevy of answers and you kind of look at the ones that come out and you know, you'll know you'll you'll see the voices, you'll see the, the folks typing and replying who have experience with it and you can kind of get that. The, the real trick, the cool thing with RPGs is the market is it, it's usually a seller's market because as, as a as a seller and a buyer i really like certain people's stuff you know or i really like certain creators or i like a certain system or i like the visual aspect of something so i'm going to i'm more likely to spend that money so it is okay when you're pricing things instead of your msrps to shade a little bit high um 
it'll it'll save you some some yeah. pain in the long run. Out of yeah. World Champ Game Co. When I was setting prices for Down We Go, like one of them was at eighteen, and he's like, "You obviously just want to charge twenty for that. Just charge twenty. Nobody who is going to back it at eighteen isn't going to back it at twenty. We do this to ourselves all the time. Stop." And I was like, yeah. "That's so, it's so freeing. Like it's so freeing." And I even yeah. I even have formulas for how I determine my costs so that it's not a choice I make. Jay, you wanna you wanna add I in do, on how I you do, do MSRP? Yeah. So Possum Creek has standards for like what our baselines are. I will also note right now we are in a period of inflation and recession. So if you're comparing numbers to stuff even four years ago, those probably are inaccurate. You should be charging more. Like your zine is going to cost more than what it did four years ago because that's what is the world we live in right now. Um, absolutely agree with everything both of you have said. I want to especially note just a couple of really good like rules of thumb to keep an eye on to make sure you're not hideously undercharging, uh, which is first off, um, you should, if you take the cost of printing, right, the cost of printing one object, the MSRP should be at absolute minimum at least six times the cost it took to print rounded up to the nearest $5. And, not, That's, and let me clarify, not 4X, which is a number I've seen floated around a lot over the last little bit because i fully agree 6x is six the minimum at number. minimum at right. like at, at desperate minimum 6x so if it costs you three dollars to print a zine you should be charging at least twenty dollars per zine at least and like that's that is again the minimum and additionally it should be that if you are selling something at 50 percent off you are still making some money. Mm -hmm. You should never, you should always be making some money even if you're selling something at 50% off. Um, and that way, that those are just some rules of thumb I use when I'm like setting prices for something to be like, is this unreasonable? And sometimes what happens is I've got this idea for a cool product. Like for example, right now, Possum Creek Games, we have Wickedness, which is one of my favorite books we sell, which is three zines in a dust jacket. Um, and the zines have gold cover. Uh, it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful set of books. It also costs like it is also an unfeasible amount of money to manufacture. Like it is, it is far too like the like in order to price it reasonably based on like the current cost, like the fact that you know paper has gotten more expensive than it did when we first started selling that book, and or you know like you know, distribution and and collation and all those things have gotten more expensive that product we couldn't make it now and I, we're not we're going to be changing how we approach it because uh it's unfeasible and sometimes you just have to look at the cool idea you have of the cool thing you want to make and be like wow this object is awesome uh it also would mean that i have to charge at least 200 dollars a copy in order to if for it to be a reasonable price and no one's going to pay $200 for this. Therefore it's not cool enough to justify making. And wickedness and, is not $200. The wickedness is not, would not be $200. However, wickedness like properly should be priced at like 150 mm -hmm. a thing. Like if I was doing the, if I was doing the rules of thumb, I just said, and it's not that much because no one would pay that. And sometimes that's just a call you've got to make is you just got to look at it and be like, yeah, it's the, it's the publishing version of killing your darlings is like, I've got a really cool idea for a product. I don't have the scale to make it. Yeah. If you wanted to print the Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition monster manual, like if that was a thing you were doing, if you're like first time crowdfunding that you'd probably need to charge like $150 a book to make the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. Hasbro makes that book beautiful for $40 a book because as Jarrett said, the economy of scale is on their side. They can afford to print a hundred thousand copies and just sell that for years. And that you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said, I, we've seen four X and this is not, this is not cause they may be in the chat. This is no shade on anybody who's thrown that number around. Um, I, I always tell people your goal every single time should actually be 10 times the cost of print. Anything above that I would consider unethical unless it is a gain leader, meaning it's specifically offsetting other very expensive projects you have and you would assign that very differently. But the goal should be 10 times. I mean, if you spend a dollar fifty to print it, it should cost you fifteen dollars, right? Um, and so like for me, the first X pays for the copy of the game. The second X 
uh, pays for the replacement copy that you have purchased to, to be able to sell another one to keep your company moving forward. The third is when you pay yourself. And that might sound really weird, but I think that's really important. Like, I don't pay myself until I've replaced that copy. Um, I also make sure I pay myself before I do a lot of other things. <clears throat> 4X lets you get a wholesale rate. Um, 5X, and you can move these around however you want to. Uh, 5X lets you pay your other <laughs> contributors well. 6X lets you pay for the infrastructure you need for a project more intentionally because having a product versus having a business or keeping that project going are two different things. Number seven lets you start to put money in the bank. Uh, 8X lets you start working on the next project or future projects. Um, number nine lets you put more money in the bank because I think sustainability um, and the ability to have security of assets is a great thing. But if you don't want to put more money in the bank, pay people better, like just up the amount you're paying people. And then 10 is that, that sale percentage that Jarrett mentioned. Like, can I just put this on sale when I need to, to help it move a little bit better? So that six to 10 X is where we live at, at plus one. We have some 10 X things. We have, we have pamphlets sometimes go to 12 X because they're, they're loss leaders. Sometimes if it's like, Hey, we've got something that's through the void, the, the, uh, the ash can version, which you can get right live right now at plus one exp.com, um, is a little bit more expensive out of that range. Uh, so we've got a couple of pamphlets that we printed right away with it because we wanted to have a gain leader to help offset the cost of that print and be able to bundle them together as a set to make it come into those range. So even when you're building your project, sometimes it's not about that stretch goal, but it's about what's the add-on you want to offer or what's the other thing you're putting in here to offset that cost to get you into those good numbers. Um, and so you you just want to kind of figure uh uh now i will drop those x's in the chat i was gonna uh, say you're reading from somewhere aren't you i am I'm, yeah i'm reading from my chat with kurt uh where i sent him those a little while ago because i could remember that's where it was should mm -hmm. we have those as a document somewhere should i put those out somewhere um do you absolutely. Want to an article do you want a blog post should i do a blog should i do a video should i do a video on a youtube a channel pamphlet. about make that you should, you should make a pamphlet somebody hit clip somebody hit clip on twitch uh for us i'll drop those i'll drop those in the chat um those are those are mine when i'm looking at things and again i can sacrifice any two of those i want like i can sacrifice any two of those i want and still be in great shape i can sacrifice any four of those i want and still be in really good financial shape. Once you start sacrificing more than that, you start to put yourself and your project in peril. If you go below 4X, you immediately become unsustainable. 4X yeah. is the bare minimum, and I would say is too low of a threshold yeah. um, really to be be something that we can maintain. Um, it's going to be horribly, horribly formatted, but here those are in the chat. Um, uh, and and just in, in case anyone is like, oh, those numbers are just like, what? that seems so high. Uh, I used to own an independent record label in the early 2000s as part of a group. It was six of this. <laughs> those numbers are the same. Like they're like not not codified. Like Tony's list is awesome. But it's it's it, that same thing. I mean, we used to shoot for we had to deal with Warner Brothers ADA. We had a blank check. We could print whatever we wanted. And the prices that Warner set were literally 10 times production costs. We would get a CD printed for a dollar fifty and we would sell that CD for 15 bucks. Like it's 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 been so as far as as long as I've owned or been part of small businesses, it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. So don't 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 be don't be scared off, you know, like when, when people are like, oh, nobody's gonna buy my 15 or 18 dollars zine. Trust me, someone will. And the, the trick is you if you sell a few at that cost, again, follow the numbers up, then as you sell more of them, you're getting yourself in better shape to do more cool shit. And you, and you may meat castle yourself. Um, and when I say meat castle yourself, I mean way, way under charge for uh, blood fields at Black Star Station. Um, the, the, the best bang for your buck from, uh, from uh, previous zine months. Um, and you well, might do that to say, I want, I want to get a lot of people into my ecosystem, that, yeah. um, mm -hmm. like Christian did. Uh, and, th and there's a lot of success that can come from saying, I want to pull things back because really I'm trying to go grab people. So again, knowing why you're charging what you're charging, and if you're going to write some of it off as marketing and getting your name out there, that's fine. But you also create an expectation for what you produce at that cost in the future whenever you did that. Um, uh, meat castle hundred percent in the chat right now. Um, but, uh, by the way, if you haven't picked it up, copies coming soon to plus one exp .com. Um, uh, but at a much better price because I refuse, I refuse. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> Jay, what um, were you going to say? I was going to say, I want to really quickly <laughs> talk about um, pay for the replacement copy because I think that is a budgeting mistake that a lot of people make and it breaks my heart every single time, which is um, you're not trying to uh, just like I would strongly discourage you from printing exactly as many books as you need. Um, I would deeply encourage you to print twice as many books as the project has paid for. And then as you're selling those extra books, setting aside money for the reprint, because it genuinely destroys me how many fantastic projects will like come out on, you know, any crowdfunding platform. And then it's like, I hope I backed that because if I didn't, they're not for sale anywhere and they're gone. Like and the, the creator doesn't have the money to do a second print run. They're just gone. Um, and like, maybe that's your goal. Maybe you're pulling a Jack Harrison and that's like part of your thing, but uh, you shouldn't, uh, you, you should plan for like, you, you are not the, the, the Kickstarter is this, the crowdfunder is the start of the journey. It's the thing that, you are you are starting the financial life of this project and that means uh you want it to continue into the future you want to be able to you know sell it at you know sell it to uh to indie press revolution sell it to tony at plus one asp you know sell it to ratty and canty over in canada you know you want to move it places you want it you like you don't have to operate a store yourself for the project's life to matter in the future so Please do plan for at least twice as many copies as you need. And if you're like, wait, what was that that Jay just said? We're going to have Jay back at the end of Zine Month to talk a little bit more about what do we do with our project after the project is over. So oh, that that's is so cool. We I'm did, so excited. We did talk about that, and you already did say yes, whether you remember it or not. I wasn't worried about bringing it up. <laughs> I never stream. remember anything. And so you I'm like, it. I'll remember for you. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah we are going to talk your, specifically, that's what you do for me. <laughs> specifically about that because it's one of my biggest things. Like People will approach us in the middle of crowdfunding for marketing, which people should. Like if you want help support amplifying, we you we we want to help you with that, hundred percent. But then if we're too full, I'll say, but I, I'd love to do something when you release in print, and they go, oh maybe, and I'm like, that's your second round of promotion right there. You want to be yeah. getting in articles again. You want to be getting things out in front of people. You want to be excite people about the fact that you're. I'm a I'm in the middle of it right now. We're spooling up more down we go stuff because down we go is shipping out this week, next week, and the week after. And so like, we, we want to get on top of that and make sure that as it releases, I can sell the additional copies I bought really, really easily. So but we will talk more about that in the future though. Back yeah. to, You're, back to this top conversation. Yes. Um, um, your, your Kickstarter is, or your crowdfunder. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all my Zemo darlings who are doing things that aren't Kickstarter. Um, your crowdfunding project um, is an investment in the future. And I know that when you are switching from like a, you know, like I'm making things for fun to like people are giving me money in exchange for goods and services. It's really easy to have future blindness. Um, and I want, and like, that's why people criminally underpay themselves. That's why people crunch themselves for these small projects. That's why people don't print enough. You're, you're not thinking about ensuring like, your crowdfunding project should ensure that you have a second one that that is the that's the best thing to get out of the first one is a second one um i do the things i do because i crowdfunded sleep away took a little bit of the money from that spent that on some zines used that as a platform to crowdfund the next thing right like you know oftentimes i will put a little uh, like you know like a couple hundred dollars in the budget set aside like when i was smaller I would set aside like a couple hundred dollars for the cover art for the next crowdfunding project mm -hmm. because sometimes that's just like you want to future proof and future prepare yourself. People, and when I back small projects on crowdfunding platforms, like when I go on Zemo, I'm interested in the project. I'm also interested in the creator. I'm willing to pay like 25 bucks for a zine or, you know, 30 or whatever, you know, for like a tiny, for like a thing that maybe. I wouldn't spend that much money at Target on because I want to pay, I want to ensure the creator can make a new thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be it would make me very sad to for you to make something really cool and then I never get to make 
see more cool stuff from you. Um, so, um, and remember, again, we asked the question and the like, hey, I've got a game now, what workshop that, that Jarrett and I did. If you're doing this for a hobby, that's fine. Some of these rules might not apply to you. You can go lower. You're not looking for sustainability in this. And that is okay. Like that is, I, I want to affirm you. If you're just like, I just do this for fun. I don't care about sustainability. I want to, bes- like, I want to, I want to figure it out every single time. That is okay. And and I don't want anybody to feel like that mode of, of producing is, is bad or wrong, or there's anything that is problematic about it. As a matter of fact, it's incredibly healthy to know that about yourself. And I want to affirm any creator who's in that space. and like, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, however, I do want you to think about the fact that we've talked about market research and if you charge low, it can create a perceived value for other creators that it needs to be. And that's, that's just a tension we need to take into account because we, as a community, like we owe each other consideration of each other's projects. Uh, but if this doesn't quite fit your mindset for how you want to operate in this space, that's fine. Ignore us. Like it's totally okay. Take what you can leave what you can. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, because we're still in our opening questions. This is what I love. Um, uh, where, where are we printing and where are we delivering it to the cost of actually getting the goods landed as we might call it, which is part of the cost of producing something who tossed that idea out. Um, which one, where, at? where, are, was, we, where are we printing and where is it getting delivered to as part of, uh, the basic no, budget questions? That was I, probably, you. I, probably, I probably said that, um, yeah, any thoughts on that besides saying I, it? I, I, um, I thoughts on it. You go for it. Though. Yeah, it was it, probably what Jay's going to say, but it's essentially, um, Look at where you look at distance, location, shipping, worldwide shipping crisis. Like for example, right now, Royal Mail is really borked. Uh, and I know a lot of UK creators are having trouble getting stuff in and out. Um, it's hopefully be it. They got hacked. So it's hopefully it's being adjusted soon. But those are all the sorts of things, you know, we all just look through a major paper crisis. Um, and noticing that you know running numbers last week like things are starting to get a little bit better but who knows you know like jay said earlier like inflation it who knows what's going to happen so being aware of the the cost of the physical print any sort of sales tax um any vat if you're shipping to or from countries that have that involved um sometimes you want to pay a little bit more if it's closer to your warehouse or to your, or your fulfillment center, whatever that is, you know, you want to have things done in country X because they're going to get to this warehouse, you know, time is money. It's not just how much it costs to print something. Like sometimes it's worth a little bit extra if you can make sure it fits in your budget to get something done closer to, you know, I said where, where you're fulfilling at. If you're working with Mixium, you can do that on what one, two, three, four countries right now, and they'll ship to most most countries, most continents. So uh, it kind of spreads out a little bit from there. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I had. Um, pardon me, I'll be right back. Oh yes, for sure. Um, I wanted to also just mention um, we're living in the middle of a mass disabling event. Um, COVID uh, has left a lot of people disabled. I certainly and like you know, certainly a lot of people are realizing they're disabled in ways that maybe they weren't aware of a few years ago. Um, I myself, you know, I'm much like when I did my first project, it, I had 500 backers. I really need to send about four, which meant I had to send, I think like 350 packages. Um, and it took a weekend and four friends helping. Um, and I could not do that again. I, there's no way in hell I could do that. Um, if you are a disabled creator, Um, a challenging, like one of the structural inaccessibilities of being a disabled creator, like, right, like, like we live in a world in which this is the price we have to pay is that sometimes you have to budget in a bit more to accommodate for your own disabilities. You cannot fulfill a thousand orders from your living room. If like, you could maybe do it if you're able to, you certainly, I do not anticipate you can do that if you're disabled, especially if you've got to deal with a job and all that other stuff. Um, don't delude yourself. Don't um, mess up your project because you put this, you didn't, you were like, oh God, I don't want to spend money on, and I'm going to do shipping in the cheapest way I possibly can, which is me in my living room with a bunch of media mail packages. That will hurt. It will really hurt. It'll ruin your ability to do this. It'll cause a lot of burnout. 
um, it is a worthwhile investment to get someone else to sh deliver, like to, to distribute for you. And maybe what that looks like is a pizza party with a bunch of friends wearing N95s. Maybe what that looks like is reaching out to Tony or Indie Press Revolution or Deernicorn or any of the other, or whatever your local equivalent is if you're in the EU, UK, Canada, wherever. Um, finding those people who do that kind of distribution and fulfillment and working with them, they might be able to like, help you out a bit because you're a small creator, but it's a worthwhile like investment and uh, you shouldn't be like, that is what you got to do, right? That is just like, I know for a fact, I cannot do self-fulfillment. I, uh, for two months, I had two packages sitting in the back of my car that like due to some mess up thing, I had to get to some backers and it took for eight, it took forever because that's just a limitation I have. Um, Learning your limitations is really important and it's okay to spend a little like budget in an accommodation need. Uh, Jupiter in orbit and everybody else who asked for audio bouncing. Let me know if this is a little bit better. I, I moved some things around. Um, but yes, the joke is that uh, Plus One EXP is owned by a 3PL and fulfillment company. So if you are looking for distribution help, we would love to chat with you. Uh, we do have some great clients, including both of the two people on screen, neither one of whom was asked to talk about that uh, specifically. Uh, we yeah, do have a. I'm, we do have, I'm not sponsored by Plus One EXP. Right. We I'm do the opposite of sponsored by them. We do have a workshop of uh, on fulfillment specifically coming up because it is a huge uh, question. But yeah, I mean, you've got to ask yourself both the the monetary cost and the material cost and your first time shipping yourself, if it's a couple hundred packages, like you'll be able to do it. If you, if you give yourself time, pace it out, work with your local post office, you'll be able to do it. anything above that. When you start, you start needing to buy equipment, it immediately becomes a question of, do I want to keep on doing this myself or do, or do I want to uh, move out? Uh, you could, you could go to ttrpg.link slash discord to connect with me. Uh, you can also email me at Tony at brandfoxllc.com. Uh, to find out more about that stuff. Um, the um, uh, We'll have a whole workshop coming up on on both home fulfillment, self-fulfillment, if you want to do it that way, some of your options, uh, along with working with a fulfillment partner. And not just us, but kind of what does it look like to work globally, um, especially too. So, uh, but shipping is a cost. Um, do not include shipping in your budget. Um, shipping fluctuates more rapidly than almost any other part of what we do. Over the course of the last couple of years, we watched shipping go from packages being like eight to $10 to Canada about four years ago um, to now it's $20. It's $20 to send a package to Canada. Like, um, and zines, can they fit in letter mail? Yes. Are you gonna get a high bounce, high loss and high return rate? Absolutely. Zines really need to be shipped as packages unless you're in that sub couple hundred thing where it's probably gonna slip through and no one's gonna notice. Uh, but charge shipping when you are ready to ship um, is the best advice we can give you. Charge it separately, work with a backer kit. Um, don't charge a flat fee a year or two years before you're gonna fulfill because things will balloon during that time. Um, things might get cheaper, doesn't look like it, but they might. Um, but shipping, um, shipping is a whole different concept, but it does need to go into your budget. Yes, you need to like, you need to prepare for shipping as like, effectively a second round of charges like and you like like if you if you are working on a platform that works with backer kit backer kit is kind of the number one place people go for for that if you are working on a platform which does not work with backer kit there are other platforms you can use to charge shipping after the fact but charging shipping after the fact when you are ready to ship is i think like the thing that makes smaller crowdfunding feasible or else fluctuations in shipping can just ran, run rampant through your budget. I have seen, uh, like, if you look at a lot of older projects, like if you go on Kickstarter, you go back to like 2015, uh, and you go through those, you'll see a lot of them did charge shipping uh, as part of, like, it's like, like you could charge shipping and then you it would be added to the Kickstarter total you made. So you'd see a lot of projects that had very ballooned total funding but then when you looked at it, it's like, oh, a third of that is for shipping, and it wasn't enough money. Yeah. Um, and that happens all the time, yeah. and you so badly don't want to be in that spot. Yeah, Kickstarter will include any funds it collects. And also, again, this comes into another thing you need to take into account. What about mm -hmm. fees? The crowdfunding platform fee, you basically need to assume that you're going to lose 10% to taxes and fees yeah. from whatever number you pick. So that's, that's that's your crowdfunding platform fee and the credit card processing uh, and then like returns, I just always estimate a flat 10% yep. of like, 
and it's tricky, but like there is a way to set up your spreadsheet so that like you can do your subtotal and then it'll like auto generate the you know ten percent amount. You know, like you kind of like it's like a little bit of number function funkiness because you kind of have to multiply the numbers the right way. But you know, figure out the the math on that or ask a friend or find a find a way to just estimate that. Mm -hmm. But like know that like if you make four thousand dollars you will get 3,900 in the bank account. And because if, if you're using crowdfunder, I will throw out there, um, like the, the site crowdfunder, uh, they don't have a platform fee unless you're opting to pay one. So you can, t you can cut that in half, but you still need to keep 5% for credit card processing, taxes and returns intact. I would probably go closer to 6%. Um, but um, you still need to keep in mind that there are gonna be fees, even if your crowdfunding platform is not charging you for one. Um, you know, Jay, you mentioned spreadsheet formulas, other stuff like that. Jared, I know that that um, for EF and a lot of the work that you've done, there are kind of these refined algorithms. Uh, what does it look like to kind of build formulas? If you had told me as a 12 year old that the one word program I would super want to know better as an adult was Excel, I would have laughed in your face. And it's all, I just, I just want to build character keepers and make better spreadsheets for crowdfunding stuff. Tony, That's all Tony, I want to do in life. Excel. Let's hang on and have an Excel play date. Excel party. So. Uh, what you do is what I do, and you find a, you have a friend who's really good at Excel. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I have a degree in accounting, and I really make beautiful spreadsheets. And I was like, Mark, I love you. I'm going to send you my ugly spreadsheets, and you're going to think he, he's going to make them all pretty. Um, awesome Creek is run entirely by people with OCD. Uh, and our spreadsheets are gorgeous. <laughs> Just, you know, a lot of downsides to being mentally ill. A plus is that we make some delightful little internal spreadsheets. <laughs> you can track those numbers all day. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm stressed out by email. It's time to balance some budgets for and, fun. And if you, if you are like, oh, man, I wish I could get a hold of those, start asking around in the community. People will have them. People will typically happily make them available to you walk through them and that's not putting anybody here on the spot that's just saying there those exist out in the community uh nevin holmes who has uh, uh dino cars coming out as part of zemo and has mm. year in space and everything's fucked uh coming out uh shortly afterwards does a great job of building out these spreadsheets is usually pretty happy to talk to people about their process also we were going to try to get them on but they have to work a day job uh during this time also too so uh couldn't be here but uh, they do an absolutely phenomenal job with it um, as well. So um, uh, we talked a little bit about cost of goods, um, and that should include everything. That should include editing, writing, other things like that. For your crowdfunding project, you have the product cost and you have all the other costs, right? So you have all the other things that you may still be actively raising money for. Because I don't know if you know this or not, y'all, not everybody goes into a crowdfunding project with a 100% completed project ready to roll off. Some people are still in the process of development, and that is, that is besides marketing, the actual reason crowdfunding started and exists uh, is to help cover those things. So you've gotta take those into account, uh, consider those, um, look at look at all the different things that go into it. Um, and yes. then, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Jay. Oh, I was just gonna say really quick, um, there was a question earlier about like, when do you know to start crowdfunding? I know my limitations and I always do crowdfunding after I'm done writing such that like, if I can't do any more writing, the project is still good, good to go. Um, things like editing and art are the two things you'll most want to skimp on because it's like, Oh, do I really need an artist? Do I really need, can't I edit my own work? Um, mm -mm. Uh, you can't. You'll most want to skimp on, but shouldn't. Correct. Yes. Okay. There I we go. We say uh, having a good editor is worth their weight in gold. Um, factoring them into the cost is just like that's how much words cost to me is like words cost the cost of paying the writer plus cost of paying an editor. Um, the And then the cover art of your crowdfunding project is at your scale, any scale underneath like $50,000 minimum projects, like at your scale and at most people's scales, your cover art is dollar for dollar the most valuable piece of marketing you can invest in your cover art is your is like your crowdfunding project can frankly be to just pay for cover art an editor and printing and like that is your smallest possible budget and it is good your like your cover art is worth its weight in gold it is so it is more valuable than any marketing you can invest in probably like please that's the most like please like 
you know, like like many cover artists, I like I like it can be hard to get money for an artist before you've done the crowdfunding project. You can work out things with artists where you're like, hey, are you willing to make a piece? And then I don't pay you until after the crowdfunding project, if that artist is okay with that setup. Um, please find a way to have good cover art. Uh, it is the best thing you can invest in. Like, this is just like, please, that's all. That's, I just really wanted to emphasize that that's, that's the center of your budget. That and printing is the most important thing. Jared, uh, should people edit their own work? I'm going to, I'm going to stab Christian, Christian Sorrel. <laughs> In the, in the chat, uh, people are talking no, about right now. Actually, you actually, can't edit your own work. Like, actually, meet meet and I are having a having a meet on Friday, I think. Yeah, um, to talk about some future stuff. So, um, I mean, sure, uh, everyone can, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a decision that that folks make, and I I get it, you know, they're they is what it is. I. You're being so kind right now. I'm so I know, impressed. I know. I'm writing right there. I'm writing you right You should not. Right Your brain uh, fills in all the holes. You know what you intended. You will not read the mistakes that you have made. You will read what is supposed to be there. Uh, do not edit your own work. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really because essentially, would you have a manuscript? Uh, it's a, it's, it's your DM notes. It's your yeah. GM notes. It's, it's how you're going to prep to run a session or multiple sessions and you really need somebody else to to you know to to give it a look um you know having somebody else run it having somebody you know feel it over like spitballing going back and forth it's always it's always 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 super mm -hmm. super 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 good to have that you can you can kind of tell stuff that does work and it doesn't work you know you can kind of see see certain things that maybe you know those holes weren't quite fully tested and stuff and i mean as as a lifelong editor it's i've i've had some things that oh yeah no we, we skipped that room because well we just didn't go there well that's the room that everyone points out repeatedly yeah i i <laughs> let my first <clears throat> uh, i let my 12 year old edit i toaster uh and it turned out immensely better for just having somebody who wasn't me read through it and do a basic grammar pass on it. Um, and I will say there are very few, like I, I've yet to find a substantial like editorial issue in that book. So I'll, I'm hiring my 12 year old anytime. They're, they're now 14, um, you know, and, uh, but I, this, it's where we were at, right? I read it. I had some friends read it. I had them go through it. And then I paid them a flat fee on a weekend to just go through and be as intensive as possible and gave them incentives for finding errors, which meant they looked for them as hard as they possibly could. Uh, and it was great. It was great. It's great collaboration with one of my own children. Possibly at the end of the whole process we have in our, in our discord server, we have, a uh, so grub is my business partner and does the layout and art direction. And so she's always the final editor, right? She's always, cause she's the one putting it into layout. So she's always the one catching any last little mistakes, kind of like she edits sentences if she has to, you know, she's very, she's, she, you know, she loves to, she'll just message me and be like, hey, did you forget to make this sentence mean anything? And I'm like, yes. Um, but she's got a role on the server that's Grub's Little Helpers, where she brings in all of the most persnickety Possum Creek fans to like, just get on a call with her and trawl the, the PDF as like one final beta read. Um, and it's always like a very delightful little uh, expedition of just people getting to call, tell her she's wrong over and over. And just like relationships like that, right? Like your edit, like editing takes a ton of different forms. Playtesting is arguably a form of editing and just doing it as much as possible in as many contexts as possible is, and paying for it when you can is really important. Yep. Yep. Uh, Cassie, yeah. Cassie Moth, when live edited some of my stuff, uh, our stuff on stream the other day, Jared, she did a flip through, through the void. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, none of it's, none of it's textual. It's all spacing issues, uh, yeah. so far. Yeah. So, but it's still, it's still good catches. And you're going to find that even after you send it to print, you're going to mm -hmm. find something like, but you there still want to there, there are typos in the first printing of Wander Home, which haunt me to this day. I literally, they, like we, we did so much editing on that book and still there's like one or two mistakes that made it through and they, they. They keep me awake. They kept me awake at night for a long time. I'm going to drive us. Go ahead, Jared. I was just saying the, the 2% rule. Uh, it's if, if there are a hundred words on the page and you fuck up two of them, it's pretty good. Cause you got the other 98, right? 
that's it it literally is what it is it's like there will just, always be a mistake in your mind. there's always going to be yeah. something but that um, doesn't I mean, mean don't pay for editing that means right. accept the fact yeah. that it's an imperfect reality mm -hmm. and we have things that we're going to we're going to catch later on and that's what second and third mm -hmm. it's why you want to pay for that second copy right off the bat so you can print the corrected copies uh, mm -hmm. Later on, um, there are people who will buy them just because they're like, I've got the misprints in the first edition, and now I want the second edition, and they'll pick mm -hmm. which one they're going to play with. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple things before we do some questions and maybe drive a few key points home, because uh, I know we've got to we've got to end soon. Um, stretch goals, right? How do we? How do you decide when, where, and if to build in stretch goals outside of the question of can I manage it or do I just want to create a project with no stretch goals to keep it easy, right? If we're going to include stretch goals, how do we start to figure out what those are and what they look like? I have really divisive opinions on this. So Jared, you should probably take the lead because I'm going to, I'm going to hot take. But. No, you're good. Um, so whatever you do, however you decide to do it, whatever fancy tchotchkes you want to add, go all the way out when you're setting your goals when you're setting your budget go all the way out to a million dollars and then come back from there set it go all the way out and it doesn't have to be a million dollars but jay, set, jay said that twenty thousand dollar mark earlier and i actually think that's yeah. a really for a zine quest project or yeah. a zemo project that yeah. 20k marks a really good a really good point point to yeah. look at um, and I guess the, the other real quick thing with stretch goals is have them planned out beforehand. Once you press that launch button, what you have planned is what you need to go with. Do not scramble to add. If you find yourself with the, with the feeling to scramble to add, fight it. Like call someone, literally yeah. <laughs> just call someone you trust and be like, should I do this? And they will say, no uh well they, hopefully they say no because all your 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 you what's the five p's so you have pro, proper planning and preparation prevents poor performance right six p's whatever um if if you if you deviate from that plan you're asking you're asking for delays you're asking for delays you're asking for delays and guess what delays result in upset backers and you have to go all the way back to the beginning do you want to deal with upset backers? I don't. I really don't. I don't like being an upset backer. You know, I can turn it off, but eh, what is this? The only way to make money is I'm just sell dice. Yeah, wait. Well, Tony. Um, Tony. You can make money selling dice. It's just, again, plan for it. Ha know before you press that launch button, I'll say it again. Know exactly what you plan to make if you hit those certain numbers. And if you don't hit those certain numbers, admit that it's okay to not make that thing you know save it for another one just be like hey it happened we didn't we didn't quite get to the 100k mark or whatever yeah. it is you know on on this particular project you know are people going to be upset uh, i guess so uh, I had but... a, yeah i had a friend recently releasing a system they also had pre-contracted to pay people and had paid people like it was all every all, the, the money was raised uh to do an adventure uh, anthology right uh, they they were very close to <clears throat> not hitting that amount, and they were like, "What do I do?" And I was like, "It's easily just your next project in eight months when you have gotten this one out, and people are excited about your system. You are now ready to release the anthology for your system because you have already paid these people, and you just need a raise to print. Yeah, that's that's a great problem to have. It's easy to kick that stuff down the road." Sometimes people are like, I, I, I would I would never disagree with don't plan everything out in advance. Have everything set in advance. Never scramble. Never add. If if the community like really feels really strongly about we really want this, you're getting a lot of customer feedback. You can consider very concertedly what you're going to do post campaign to try to make that reality in the backer kit or something else. You don't have to add it as a stretch goal. Just because you have them all planned in advance doesn't mean you have to announce them all at the same time. And you can't adjust when you put them out because if you if you triple your top goal if you go to if you go to fifty thousand dollars in the first day on your twenty thousand dollar expectation but you only announce three stretch goals great you can just change the numbers on everything if you want to or not and just now do the version of the game that you were really excited about but just because you know them all and have them planned doesn't mean you have to do more jay what's your give us your hot takes every single stretch goal should have a purpose every how dare you how dare you 
so there are there are purposes. So like, let's talk about some kinds of purposes a stretch goal can have. One of them uh, is because it makes you happy. That is a totally reasonable reason to have a stretch goal. Um, another one is because you think that having the stretch goal will generate more money for you. This is what a stretch goal is supposed to be. Most are not, but like, you know, that's a kind of stretch goal. It's like, and then a third kind is um, something that you think is important, but you couldn't justify in the base cost. So for example, um, if I'm making a game and I think it's really important for this game to have like art by this one artist, but we couldn't fit that artist into the budget initially. I might have that artist as a stretch goal because I would like to work with them, but like, I think they'd be good for the game. Um, I don't necessarily, like, you know, let's say for example, like with that artist, right? Like Adam DeSouza working on Yaseba's Bed and Breakfast, who's one of our stretch goal artists. Um, part of that was that I like Adam and I really wanted to work with him for a piece in the game. Part of it is that I felt that he has an audience that's different than ours and that could generate traction and attention and move us forward as we go through the the, the month. Um, partially it was that I think the game is better for his art in it and the game would be worse without it. Um, those are all three good reasons to have a stretch goal and that spot. Um, you, If a stretch goal, like, if a stretch goal doesn't make you feel those ways, like, if you're kind of, like, having stretch goals for the sake of having them, uh, if you feel obligated to, um, that's really bad. A stretch goal, and certainly if a stretch goal feels tedious or you're annoyed, like, it's like, oh, I have to do more work now that this stretch goal has been reached, that's really bad. That's a lot of complexity and bloat. For Wander Home we had too many stretch goal writers. We had like 10 or 11. And we had to hire someone to manage the stretch goal writers. We literally like deputized someone to like take care of it because it was, there were so many people to have to handle there. Um, and that's bad. Like you don't want to be in that spot. You don't want to be in a spot where your stretch goals are adding all this additional complexity on top of the project. Um, that's why stretch goals that are just like paying your friends more, like you know, paying the contributors more, are really good, but also those stretch goals don't necessarily move, uh, they don't move money. They don't move, like they're not gonna like, you're not gonna get a ton of extra backers because you're promising to pay people more. And you so should, balance, but you won't. You, it would be nice if you did. It would be, I wish we lived in a world where that was the case. Um, but it's still important. Like it's still a morally good act. Not all morally good acts need to be good publicity. Um, uh, but, uh, you don't need that many stretch goals. You don't need stretch goals. Do stretch goals because you want them. Uh, you think that they they won't, like they're, you want them, they're minimally complicated and they make the project better. Um, if they make the project bloated, if they make your logistics harder, if they don't spark joy, they are dog shit and get them out of here. Sorry for cursing. That's all right. Um, Thank you. Um, just like really, like if you're trying to hit 20K, if that's your big dream number, you maybe have four or five stretch goals max. Um, I'll also say one final note is there are some stretch goals that you don't even have to tell people about if they're just for you. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I love to see pay bonus stretch goals. I'm just saying that they're not, you know, they don't move that many backers. That's just a truth, sadly. I actually, um, I actually don't love pay bonus stretch goals. I just think you should pay people more money when you make more money. I, yes. I hate it when people list it as a stretch goal. It's fine. People need to do what they do, but I'm just yeah. like implicitly, um, I we have a yeah. policy where when we hit certain benchmarks, everyone gets paid more, and it's just a statement that's, we make. That's just a good policy. Yeah, I mean, we list this stretch. Yeah, that's true, and that's actually an example of a policy. Like, you don't have to put that on your stretch goal list. Um, for Possum Creek. We, um, if there's like, you know, an artist we wanted to work with, but we didn't want to, like for some reason they weren't really a good fit for promotion or something, we might just, you know, know that we will hire, like, you know, if there's an artist we want to have do more art, uh, and we'll just know if we hit 50K, we'll have that artist do more art for us. And like, we don't have to announce that. We don't have to make it be our one stretch goal. We can just know that. I also finally want to note one final thing. When budgeting for your stretch goals in your, like, what's the gap between your the, the rate and the stretch goal, you can't just be like, well, it'll cost $500 to hire this person, so $500 above my goal will be the person. I see that a lot, and it's agonizing because that's, you're that, 
literally not yeah books the 500 dollars worth of books still needs to be paid for the the like you need to think about how much of that is profit and of that profit what percentage of that do you want to sacrifice to bring someone else on board right. and the answer has to be less than 50 percent right you cannot be setting aside your profit in order to do that thing because now you're just simply messing yourself and up it, and if you can't do it for you do it for the ability to hire somebody else cool the next time because if, if, yes. yes. if you can't cover your cost we can't you can't create sustainability for your projects you can't hire somebody to do the cool stuff you want to do in the future uh, mm -hmm. we've got to end up because we do have a hard stop uh, in about five minutes uh but a couple of things we want to drive uh home that are really important like we already talked about shipping crowdfunding platform fees um we are not CPAs, but CPAs are your friends. Um, you got to think um, about, and I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's points here. Uh, you got to think about what your financial calendar is for tax season. And if you have a company, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, financial flow it operates on, um, as well as what sort of company you are. Uh, if, if you're like, I don't want to start an LLC because I'm not, I'm, I'm only doing one Kickstarter a year. I'm just going to take the hit on my normal taxes. That's fine. That's a, that's a choice you make, right? I would still start an LLC, um, even if it's a sole proprietorship, so that you have the legal protections that it affords. Uh, but the reality is um, it gets very complicated to do your taxes for these things. You should hire somebody to do your taxes for these things, if at all you can afford to hire somebody to do your taxes for these very, things. Very, very fast. Here's a very silly mistake that many uh, starting backer, many starting crowd funders will make, and it is a very good reason why you should hire a CPA. Um, is uh, you launch your project in November, you make $20,000. You're printing the project and spending 15,000 of those dollars in the next year. You are taxed for $20,000 $20, in profit in the first year and are judged by the IRS for losing $15,000 the next year. You just paid so much more tax than you had to. If you There's some paperwork you can file to avoid that and it's different by country. Uh, and it like, you need to see, you need someone who knows what to do, right? You need someone who knows how to handle that. It's a, it's little things like that, that genuinely would not occur to me if it wasn't for the fact that like, it almost happened to me. So like, and like, I know people it has happened to like someone will have a, a surprise success Kickstarter and they're not prepared. And then they look like a fool in tax season. So please do you think about that somehow? So sales taxes will vary state by state. What you have to charge, these are some questions that came in as we went. Sales taxes will vary state by state. What you have to charge will vary state by state. Typically, whether you have to charge taxes in a state has to do with that state's laws, your state's laws, and whether you have a physical presence in that state or not. It's super complicated in the U.S. It's not even taking uh, international shipping tariffs and fees into account. Um, if you're working with a fulfillment partner, and we'll cover this more next week, and they can typically talk to you about how to handle that now, that's actually far more under control than it was historically. And there are good resources for helping take care of that process is another great reason to work with a fulfillment partner. Um, uh, you should pad your funding. You don't need to pad it a ton. Three to 5% is going to get you there. Um, just going up to the next large number, depending on your Rainy scale is going to help. Yeah. Yeah. And then we talked a little bit about whether when you decide if funding is the way to go. And I would say start by approaching publishers. Uh -huh. Look at what you can do out of your own pocket. Can you afford to just print this and start hucking zines at conventions? Great. That's far easier than crowdfunding. And if so, you should do it. Is, do you want to work with a publishing partner uh, like Plus One or Space Penguin Inc. or Possum Creek Games um, to get your game uh, into the world? Because maybe they're interested in helping support you in your funding or printing it for you and just getting it out there. All of those things are great questions. Uh, and finally, we kind of get to, so what's my number? And we're going to land right back where we started. You're going to take all of the cost of goods to do it. You're going to figure out what your MSRP are. You're going to figure out that big high number that you want. You're going to inflate it a little bit based on fees and that rainy day fund and everything else. And then you're going to figure out what your MSRP does, it looks like, what your, how many of your core offering and uh, you think you can get from each backer. And you're going to try to figure out can I get that many backers to come fund this project? Those are the numbers that at the end of the day, you care the most about. There's a lot more of a refined process that can go into that. But for all the stuff that we've covered, that is the quick synthesis uh, right here at the end. Uh, uh, Jarrett, final thoughts, as well as where can people find you now or in the future? SpacePenguin.inc, um, all that social stuff coming soon. 
you know, you know this, Tony. I know, you know I know, this. I know. I, I, I think it's like it very well. well. Um, so. Yeah, um, and as I mentioned in the last week's uh, last week's episode, um, I made the decision for my company for the first year to not endeavor in crowdfunding as a veteran of many crowdfunds already, um, working with with and for other folks, um, and I, I, you know. Be, my thing at the very beginning was, do you have confidence to do that? And I could tell you, my heart is not in it to to do that stuff. Like I just, it's the the cons of just dealing with the weight of existence. It's not for me. And adding, you know, that's just normal life. And I don't want to add that into the thing I love, which mm-hmm. is games. Yeah. So uh, I'm making that decision right now to and you currently have the privilege and the capability to not have for sure working towards you know um slow and steady you know doing things a a little bit smaller and not making that big that big like ah splash and yes i i've worked in this business for 11 years now and i've got a lot of friendships and favors and other things that i'm i'm working around and able to turn in um but that being said uh who knows Maybe eventually that'll be a thing. Maybe there'll be a mutation. You know, I'm interested in seeing what happens with, with this crowdfunder thing that everyone keeps talking about, ma- namely you, Tony. Um, I'm interested in, in seeing uh, what, what that aspect of it. Um, uh, back, crowdfunding by backer kit. Um, you know, shit. Jason Fury, if you're watching this, hi. Uh, love Jason. And I, and I love backer kit. They're great people. Um, in I'm interested in seeing how that's changing things and, and, you know, like, um, just the overall feel I'm, I'm always watching it. I'm always looking out. Um, and who knows, maybe someday there'll be like a, a synthesis of all this that works for me. So awesome. Jay, uh, where can people find you on the doobly doos and, uh, any, any parting thoughts? Hey, darlings, find me on Twitter or Tumblr or TikTok because I'm a stinking zoomer. Uh, I'm Jay Dragski on all those platforms, or just look up Jay Dragon. Um, also support Possum Creek Games on the Patreon. I regularly do calls. Like lately at night, Scrubby's been doing the layout on Yuzeva's Bed and Breakfast. We've just been hanging out and call and talking to people about game design and like budgeting and all this kind of stuff. I love to chat about this stuff. Um, I'm also happy to do consultations and like reduced fees and all that. So do reach out. Um, yeah, I think parting thoughts. Um, you are taking a very wild step. You are changing your relationship with games on a deep level. It's a little bit like learning how the sausage is made when you go from being someone who plays games to someone who makes games. Um, It's a different relationship. Even when you're still a hobbyist throughout that, it's still you are changing your relationship. Um, And I enjoy this side of it. I enjoy the back end more than I enjoy the front end. I prefer making games to like being a player. Um, that's not true for everyone. Um, and the, the way in which you show your love for games does not have to be to become a small business person. Uh, if you really like carving spoons, that doesn't mean you have to open a hardware store on main street. When you start a crowdfunding project, you have more in common with a mom and pop in your town than you do with another player of games. That's cool. That's good. Um, I enjoy that. I find it a lot of fun making DIY stuff, making scenes to hand out and sell, you know, getting involved in creative communities is all some of the coolest stuff you can do. Just, um, do it mindfully and do it aware of the threshold. Do be aware of your Rubicon, right? Be aware of the threshold you're crossing. Um, cause you know, just do it mindfully. Um, Yeah, a couple things. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, more streams coming up. We'll be talking about how to build a crowdfunding page, fulfillment, how to extend your campaign beyond the life of that. We have more about art, layout, composition that we'll be doing over the course of the next month. If you want to stay up to date on all of those things, feel free uh, to follow us here. Uh, any support you have for the channel is great. Um, uh, you can also check out all of our videos on demand, past content and other things over at youtube.com. Links for that, if you're watching on Twitch, uh, are down below, but you can get a at plus one exp on most platforms to find out more about who we are, what we do. You can support our games, the zines we make, and the creators that we help support through publications and print partnerships at plus one exp.com. Uh, and we're really burning hard to try to bring on more staff uh, on our team here. So if you support us over on Kofi or any of those places, it brings us closer to helping make that a reality. 
Uh, we will have a couple of Z, a, a four pack of zines dropping during Zine Month that are just going straight to print. They're all first time creators getting their games uh, in print from all over the world. We're super excited about the projects and that team. Look for more of that at Plus One EXP or on social media. Um, uh, we're, uh, uh, for all of our Zemo platform months, uh, we want to keep it weird, uh, keep it indie and, uh, no, it's keep it. What is it? Keep it, keep it DIY. Keep it weird. Keep it indie. Charlie came up with that last time. That's our sign off now for these workshops. I did it. Uh, bye everybody. We'll see y'all later. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jarrett. Thank you. Thank you, Jarrett.